Well, wake up, it's time for Java Beans. <laughs> time for Java. Okay, so this lecture is number eight. I skipped seven, it's on Corba. I'm gonna hit that tomorrow. And but this one goes along with what I was just, what I've been just talking about in terms of servlets. Talked about servlets, talked about JSP, talked about transactions. Here's the enterprise Java Bean, which is nothing more than a Java program. So it's a pretty easy lecture actually. It's about 46 slides. We'll get through this and we'll call it a day. Topics are going to cover the enterprise bean overview, enterprise bean case study, and how to build them. So that's not too bad. In terms of distributed multi tier applications, this is sort of a repeat on the JEE platform, so I'm going to kind of skip through it a little bit quickly because we've already seen this stuff over and over again. But we're looking at distributed applications running on multiple servers in a tiered environment. So the application log logic is divided out into components according to functionality. And we have various different application components that make up the application itself and that runs on different computers. Here's a picture of the multi-tiered application. We have application number one over here. We have application number two. This is like an accounting program. This is a finance program or something. It's just two programs, you know, two applications. And we have an application client, and then maybe we have dynamic HTML pages. And this is on the client machine. And then this is what we're talking about in this class here, the web tier. When you think about the web tier, that's your JSP pages interfacing through the web tier. On the business tier, that's where we're getting our enterprise beans. And our uh, back end or our persistent tier is where we're getting our database servers. So this is sort of the big picture that we've talked about so far. Actually, this is what we've been looking at um, uh, in all of the lectures today in terms of the tiering. So the components themselves, one of the interesting components is this bean technology. Um, so we have Java EE comp component. So the component is a self-contained functional software unit that is assembled as an application and with its related classes, its files, and it communicates with other components. So I'm going to start thinking about this from a component perspective. Applications, clients, applets, all sorts of components run on the client computer. Java servlets and server pages and enterprise beans run on a server. So this is another server technology. And here's our Java 2 EE server communications. <coughs> with our Java 2 EE server over here. Our web pages on our client tier, we have our web pages, our applets, our optional bean components. Could actually be on the client tier. Normally we're going to see them out here though. And the application client and the optional bean components are going to be communicating with the business tier and the web tier. So the bean components are sort of the worker bees of the system. They sort of are the glue that put things together and access uh, resources that are on the tiers. So in terms of the EE client, uh, the web client consists of two parts, dynamic web pages uh, containing various different types, markup pages, XML, JSB, well, actually they're server pages, but they're delivering HTML content, XML content, generating web components running on the web tier. And then we have our web browser, which renders the pages received from the server. Applets are sort of a thing of the past. Nobody uses applets anymore. Uh, however, they are still around and they're still supported. And they receive uh, applets themselves or web pages. A web page received from a web tier can include an embedded applet. And the applet is a small program that gets downloaded to the client's computer and runs from the client program. Application clients also could be uh, different programs and things in different various ways for the client to access the web tier. Uh, it's typically graphical user interfaces, sometimes with swing, sometimes with command line interfaces. So enterprise Java beans, why use them? So the enterprise Java bean provides developer architectural independence. What does that mean? Well it isolates developers from underlining middleware because the only environment that Java Beans sees is the Java environment. So it helps the Java Bean server container vendor to change and make improvements on the underlying middleware layer without affecting the user's existing enterprise applications. 
So there are separate components that you add on top of everything else that perform the work for you. And you just call to the components, and now you're isolated out into a Java world of your own. It doesn't really matter what other technologies are running. So they come in handy for isolation and independence, and providing independence among the application development. We also have this write once and run anywhere type of philosophy uh, for server side components. So because the Enterprise Java Bean is based on Java technology, both the developer and the user are guaranteed that their components are write once, run anywhere. <coughs> as long as the Java Enterprise Bean, <coughs> Java, excuse me, Enterprise Java Bean server faithfully conforms to the specifications and the third party components and it runs on the server correctly. So the Enterprise Java Bean also establishes a role for application development or pattern. Um, so it specifies the assigned specific role for project participants that change the enterprise environment for deploying Enterprise Bean. So, you know, we have the database bean that is in charge of the connections to the database, which gives us the role. So when we want to connect to the database, we go to the bean. When we connect to the uh, file server, we go to the file server bean. Um, and it provides a central access point to the resource for central management. Enterprise Java Bean takes care of transaction management for us as well as we've seen in the transaction management lecture earlier today. We looked at the concept of the bean in that lecture actually in the bean of creating a transaction object that manages the transaction so we can use a bean essentially for that role. So the container vendor is required to provide transaction control and the Java Bean developer who is writing the business functionality need not worry about starting and terminating the transactions that can all be done by the Bean that's in charge of the transaction. We can also provide distributed transaction support. So support for the transaction among di distributed computers provides transparency for distributed transactions, means that the clients can begin transactions and then invoke methods on the beans that are present within two different servers. It doesn't really matter which server they're on. It's all part of the same transaction. Running on different machines. Uh, methods in one Java bean can call methods in another Java bean with assures that they will be executed on the same transaction context, yet on different computers. So it provides a lot of flexibility when it comes to transaction support. And Enterprise Java Bean helps create portable and scalable solutions. New resource, new bean. <laughs> Just create another bean. And all of a sudden you're going to need a jar to put those beans in or a container to put all those beans in. Because uh, you've got a lot of, a lot of beans. Uh, conforming to the Java, Enterprise Java Bean, conforming to the Enterprise Java Bean API, will install and run on portable fashion on any server, any Enterprise Bean server runs all the same. Enterprise Java Bean seamlessly integrates with Corba. I'm going to save Corba for tomorrow because it's just way too much information. It's way too much theory for one day. <laughs> this is a lot of theory to begin with, but just put Corba on top of that. We'll just do that tomorrow. <laughs> so, but they both integrate seamlessly. They both work together quite well. So it's a natural combination that complements each other. Uh, so for example, the Enterprise Java B may provide a CORBA, CORBA IIOP uh, for, and I'll explain that tomorrow, robust transport mechanism for pure CORBA clients that can access beans and bean clients, currently the highlights uh, on different uh, CORBA technologies, but uh, we'll cover that tomorrow, actually, I don't even want to get into that today. Also provides vendor-specific enhancements, so the beans themselves can provide, almost like a specialized driver can provide enhancements for customized behavior for managing managing connections and doing all sorts of different specialized things because the enterprise java bean specification provides considerable flexibility for the vendor to create their own enhancements they end up being very feature rich the beans can actually be very feature rich so we're looking at the java bean component architecture so server and client tiers must also include component-based Java Bean component architectures to manage the data flow between the application servers, applets, all the different pieces of the system itself. The component is a, sort of the wrapper for all of the Bean containers and all of the Bean functionality. It's not considered 
the Java Bean components are not considered J2EE components by the J2EE specification. It's kind of terminology that's been adapted to the concept. There's no such thing, though, in a Java EE environment as a Java Bean component architecture. Uh, there's containers, but there's no component architecture. And uh, the components themselves have properties that get a set method for accessing properties themselves. And the components um, are is more of a terminology for the bean versus an implementation of a tech of a technique. And um, you know, if you follow through the methodology, it's just like regular old Java programming. You have accessors and modifiers for um, method behavior for different objects. So beans should have accessors and modifiers as well. Accessors are you know, setting setting and getting information from uh, whatever resource the bean is actually communicating with. <coughs> so Java bean components used in this way typically are simple to design, implement, should conform to the naming and design conventions owned by Java bean components architecture. So here's the web tier and the Java 2 EE applications put together in a nice little picture uh, in terms of where the bean component fits in. It's right here. And, as I was meant, and the slide actually is, is pretty nice. It says optional on it. It is optional. Mm -hmm. You don't have to use beans at all. Beans simplify, make things easier abstractly. Instead of, keep, instead of going back and forth with the web business tier or using just Java servlet pages, if you slap some beans in there, you can actually call the beans directly and use the beans. Reus the reusable components are customizable. And think of them as very small Java programs that only perform one task or one purpose. And the purpose might be, you know, having something to do with the business logic, hopefully. So, and separating out the business logic, either the, either, either the storage, the retrieval, um, archiving, or running applications. Uh, beans can be used for a lot of different pieces of the puzzle. So, they're sort of the, that's why I call them sort of the glue. They sort of sit in between. They glue pieces together nicely. Um, it's kind of like making a program to manage the programs. So, and if you think of them as resource managers, which most people actually do, then the bean manages the resource. And you just go to the bean and it serves up the resource. So web components, the Java 2e web components are either servlets or pages created by JSP, JSP pages. So servlets are Java programming language classes that uh, dynamically process requests and, and uh, construct responses. So a servlet and a Java page, as we've kind of seen, are sort of the same thing. It depends on how you're going to house it. The servlet is a program that you're going to write, you're going to compile, you're going to put it on the server. When the server starts up, it's going to make an instance of that object and it's going to serve it up. The JSP is going to be sent to it when it's first requested. It's going to be converted into a servlet, and then it's going to be housed up and made available. So it depends on, you know, it's like the chicken or the egg. So it had to turn into a servlet somehow. Was it a JSP page first or was it a servlet first? So it depends on how you're going to deliver it and what you're going to use it for as to the flexibility that you have. But the two concepts are very similar. The two, the two technologies are very similar in concept. But the servlets are Java programs written and compiled in a programming, Java programming language. The servlets are text-based documents that execute as servlets but allow a more natural approach to creating the static con content. <coughs> and non-programmer people can, uh, although they, you do have to have a background on servlets because you're really creating a servlet when you're using JSP, but it does lend itself well to a easier programming environment. Let's just put it that way. And then they can change more often. So you'd use a JSP page when the content of the page might actually change, it might be modified, uh, when versus a compiled program that you know you can still modify, recompile it, and put it back in there. But it's a little bit more, you know, not as flexible. So static HTML pages and applets are bundled with web components during application assembly, but are not considered web components by the J2E specification either. Um, although it's kind of funny that they don't consider applets a web component. It's not really running on the web, it's running on the client computer. So I think that's why. 
Client-side uh, utility classes can also be bundled with web components like HTML pages that are not considered web components either. So, And here's a picture of the business tier uh, with an enterprise information system that's loaded on here. Web pages over here, Java applets, all this sorts. Going through here, going through here's the new component here. We got the enterprise beans, the session beans, and the message driven beans. Ah, bean is a bean. They're all the same. <laughs> so the bean tier or the business tier that's going to the database and legacy systems and the enterprise system that's over here on the right hand side. Which this is a picture of a database down here. So, so you can kind of see how we're just adding components in. So we had this one. We started out with a JSP server that go into an EIS. So now we added the beans. Now we have the entity entity beans or session beans, um, which are just different types of beans made for different, uh, instead of for components, they're made for different functionality. Now in terms of the business components, the business code is the logic, the problem that's going to be solved, is the solution. It meets the needs of particular business domains such as banking, retail, finance, handling enterprise beans, running on business tiers. So the business tier might be something along the nature of log in to the customer's account or check the available flight schedule or check to see the package information from the carrier or something. So the previous slide shows how the enterprise being retrieves data from the clients, processes it if necessary, and sends it back to the information enterprise information system tier for storage. And the storage would occur in this database over here. Enterprise beans also retrieve data from storage processes if necessary and send it back to the client program. That's why I call them worker bees. Go get information, process it, send it back to the client. <laughs> Go get information, process it, send it back to the client. So little beans. Types of enterprise beans. So in this previous slide here we looked at and I mentioned enterprise entity beans session beans and message driven beans. So a little explanation about what those things are. Here they here they are now. Three kinds of enterprise beans. The session bean represents a transient conversation with the clients. Keeps track of the session information. Um, when the client finishes executing the session bean and its data are gone. Kind of like session data from a web browser. It's a se session concept but it's incorporated into a bean that resides on the server. Um, so it can be better managed. The entity bean represents the persistent data stored in one row of a database table. It's like the results set that come out of a table. Um, and that is used for processing data. Uh, so if the client terminates or if the server shuts down, the underlying services ensure that the entity bean data is saved. It provides uh, transaction support for rollbacks and for all sorts of different things for transaction management. <clears throat> message driven beans combines features of session beans with Java message service, JMS. Message listener allows a business component to receive Java messages, service messages uh, asynchronously. It stores them up. So it's kind of like a, a mailbox. All the messages end up in the bean and then you go ask the bean, what kind of messages did I get? and it tells you what messages. In terms of the enterprise information system tier, to round out your vocabulary for, for today, um, the enterprise EIS, enterprise information systems tier, handles <coughs> the enterprise software. Sometimes referred to, actually most people call it ERP, enterprise resource planning. Enterprise resource planning is not the only type of enterprise information system, however. Um, mainframe transaction processing, database systems, legacy information systems. Think of any type of information system that would run in an enterprise environment, such as an example supply chain management, customer relationship management, enterprise resource planning. All of these things are referred to as enterprise information systems. Um, and they're all in this particular tier because usually they're shared with the web environment and also with the company. So people inside of the company can be using the EIS to access information, to 
um, do their ba basic business tasks that they're responsible for doing. Um, these are the programs that are running the organization. So for example, a Java 2 EE application component might need access to an enterprise information system for database connectivity. Very classic, um, actually. So containers. <coughs> Normally, thin client multi-tiered applications are hard to write uh, because they involve many different lines of intricate code handled by transaction management, state management, multi-threading, resource planning, all sorts of different complex low-level details. So component-based and platform-independent architecture makes it easier to write the business logic, organize it into reusable components. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, you just pull out the bean, pull out the component and in the container. And the container is more like a package, if you want to say it that way. So reusable classes that have been written that can be reused over and over again in new applications. So in addition, the Java 2 EU server provides underlying services in the form of a container for every component type. And it's very similar to a packaging kind of concept. Because you don't need to develop these services yourself, you're free to concentrate on solving the business problem at hand. So we also have container services. So containers themselves are interfaces between components and low-level platform-specific functionality that supports the components. So before the web component, enterprise beans or application and client components can be executed. It must be assembled into a Java 2 EE module and deployed into its container. So assembly process, the assembly process involves specifying container settings for each one of the components. It's a configuration. So also the setting configuration or customizing underlying support provides oops, for uh, include, they may also include services for transaction management, for Java naming and directory inter inter interfaces. We'll look at this tomorrow. We have a JNDI information uh, for Java naming and directory interface. This, these are just basically other services that are provided. Um, from a programming perspective, you may or may not use half of these services, depending upon what kind of applications you're building. So, and remote connectivity, things like that. Um, containing services, highlights. Well, we have also the security model, believe it or not. <laughs> so container services include security, transaction, lookup services, and then remote connectivity. So security we've kind of covered in previous lectures lets you configure the web components or the enterprise beans so that the, so you can have uh, only authorized users are connecting. Transactions, we just talked about that this morning, specifies relationships between different tasks that are going to be performed to accumulate them into a concept of a transaction. <coughs> the lookup service <coughs> provides the interface for naming and directory services for the components. And then the remote connectivity model manages the communication between the clients and the enterprise beans. It provides information about who can connect to who, where the beans are located, um, if the beans created, the client invokes the method as if it were on the same virtual machine, it creates that transparency between the remote and the uh, local uh, machine. So it provides a remote connectivity model. Here's our container types where we have the browser, <coughs> the application client, maybe a program running goes into the web container, and here's, here's how the pictures actually kind of fit together. The web container would have the servlet and the JSP pages in them. The Java enterprise bean container would have the enterprise beans in the end, you know, more enterprise beans essentially, and these guys would work together. So abstractly, all the stuff I'm giving you is nothing more than defining different tiers <laughs> and sub-tiers on the same, same system. So we could have a web container or we could not. We could have a Java enterprise bean container or we could not. If we're going to have a bunch of beans, the best way of doing it is to separate out the abstraction. If we put it all together and mix it all up, it makes it difficult to understand. It makes it harder to, to see in terms of component-wise. <coughs> it makes it harder to maintain. So breaking it out into the different levels of abstractions make it, makes it a lot easier to comprehend to build on. And uh, to provide you some definitions for some of these things, the server is the runtime portion. 
of the Java 2 EE product. It provides the enterprise means and the web containers. Actually, you have a server loaded, you have a Glassfish server loaded, uh, if you install the EE version. Um, you can also load on different other server technologies as well. Enterprise Java Bean Container manages the execution of the Java Beans themselves, and uh, the container for running the the container runs on the server. Um, so it's just basically another, you know, it's taking this abstraction and dividing it out into two separate components that are running on the server. The web container does the same thing; it manages up the JSP pages and the server components. And then we have the application client container manages the execution of the application client components and so that runs on the client and then the applet container it manages the execution of the applets and that's over here that would be on the client side client machine packaging applications so we have the assembly root we have the xml application <coughs> application xml sun application xml different configurations for different types of uh, server environments for running the application modes. We have the web modules, we have the application client modules, resource adapter modules, enterprise Java Bean modules. All of the modules are put together into the assembly and into the WAR file or into whatever happens to be um, created from this and then there's a configuration for it. And then if it's all packaged together it's easier to transport, easier to locate. I've actually already covered transactions in a separate lecture of its own earlier today. So I'm not going to bore you with another lecture on transactions. Instead, I'm going to kind of flip through this a little bit. And uh, this is just to remind you, the slide is put in here to remind you of the concept of the transaction. Uh, so we just talked about that as early as earlier today, but normally this is done over a couple weeks. so. Recall the transaction. Okay, we got it. What is the naming service? Um, by definition, this is that uh, Java naming service, GNS. Uh, the naming service provides a natural, understandable way of identifying and associating names with data. All right, well, it enables humans to interact with complex computer addressing systems and associating data and objects with simple names. So it provides a lookup service for objects, independent from computer systems, that use them and can service any system that can connect to them and understands their protocol can service up naming services. So here's the Java naming and directory interface that is part of the J2EE. And uh, I thought this was going to come up tomorrow, but it looks, you know, this lecture actually includes a little bit on it, so I'll go ahead and cover it now. <coughs> the Java application would use the service to find the components that it needs. So the naming manager and then the naming service would be used in terms of in co correlation with Corbo, with RMI, with a bunch of other different technologies as nothing more than, it's sort of like a d domain name lookup service if you think about it in concept. It's doing address resolution. So by a name on a component, this service is providing you an easy way to identify components across the distributed network and link them up to your application so you can find things. And it was put in here as a mechanism for making a better organization in terms of the naming. Enterprise Java Beans. Uh, we already seen Enterprise Java Beans. This is uh, the second part. Of, actually, this is an example that goes through the use of it. And um, the example here does not use, this is just thrown in here actually, it does not use uh, Java naming and directory interfaces and you don't actually have to do anything for this for any of your programming assignments for this course either. Because unless you're again, unless you're running on a huge server and you had a naming system that you needed to actually put into place, you're not going to configure this or use this. In terms of an example of the enterprise Java Bean environment, <coughs> Here's one for a university student services application. The logic includes registration for students, but uh, not the underlying networking code allowing registration via web browser. So the enterprise bean typically contains the business logic. We have instances that create managed at runtime uh, by the container itself. And then we're going to customize it. Actually, here's the big picture. 
So here's an example application that's using Java Bean technology. The client's out here, the server, the basic enterprise architecture, locate, create, and remote instance here, going through the home interface, the remote instance interface, the home object, the uh, enterprise bean object, going into the enterprise bean itself, connecting to the database. So what you're doing is essentially breaking out the logic and the functionality into separate components and combining the components to create the application or to create the tiering. And this would be considered the container. The container would house all of the beans that would be uh, used for this particular connectivity. <coughs> I believe we have actually already seen uh, server technology. I've actually already defined it for you. It provides the organizational framework, execution environment for the containers, it makes available system services, multi processing, load balancing, all sorts of different things. And uh, may also provide vendor-specific control for optimized data interfaces, additional core services, SSL support, JNDI access for naming services, and transaction managers, management services all into one. So what's meant by the Java uh, Enterprise Java Bean server encompasses a lot of other technologies above and beyond uh, basic server, traditional server technologies. This one had a home interface and it had a remote interface in terms of the configuration. What that means in terms of the home interface and the home object contains the factory methods for locating, creating, and removing instances of enterprise Java beans. So it defines the home interface uh, for this particular bean and it generates the tools provided by the container vendor and provides the implementation of the home interface. And then the remote interface object itself provides the business methods that presents the enterprise Java Bean class. Remote interface is defined by the developer, obviously. And uh, in terms of the object, it concentrates the class for the remote interface is generated by tools provided by container uh, by container vendor. So wherever the vendor is, is who's actually providing the tools necessary for the application and the framework going to be part of this remote interface in terms of the functionality. In terms of containers, the containers act as the interfaces between the enterprise bean and the low-level functionality as we've seen before. In fact, we've already actually already covered containers, so I'm going to skip through this. The lecture is kind of not, not bad reading, actually, but makes for a lousy presentation because there's so much words there's some, and the concepts are repeated over and over again. So because they're repeated in different contexts. So we've already gone over the different bean types, but here we have a session and an entity container that work with the session entity type beans that would be inside of the containers. So two types of containers that exist would be the session container that contains the non-persistent beans and the states, and then the entity containing states that are saved between invocations of the different entities. Um, so enterprise Java Bean by definition, and this is sort of just to recap the concept, real enterprise bean itself is contained inside of the enterprise Java Bean container and is never directly accessed by anyone but the container. So to take the abstraction to another level, <coughs> inside of the container are all these beans, and you're really not calling the bean, you're calling the container. And in the container, the container object is finding the bean that's associated with the behavior that you're interested in invoking and the container manages that. So there's another layer of abstraction on top of that. Mediates the, So the bean mediates the enterprise Java beans themselves. So not only does the container hold the beans, it also controls the beans. <laughs> so makes the beans so they don't fall out of the jar. You put the lid on the beans. <laughs> so does not implement a remote interface with the beans itself. Uses the skeleton for that. So <coughs> here's a picture of it. And the enterprise Java Bean here we have the enterprise home, enterprise remote, session home, session remote. Here's the container for the entity, container for the session, and then the various connections to it from the outside client perspective. And then behind this is the database. So again, you know, defining the abstraction out into different le le layers, levels. 
two types of enterprise beams we'll discuss in this class later, not today. But we uh, actually looked at so far session bean and entity beans. So uh, you may download this slide set, read it at a slower pace, and uh, absorb the differences between session and entity. But uh, I've actually already given it to you a couple of times already. <laughs> um, the client itself, let me just see what else is left here. Um, don't think I want to go over the client stuff or the life cycle deploying components. <sighs> life cycles. Oops. I'm going to skip the client stuff because it's too generic. <coughs> And I have better client stuff for you tomorrow. But uh, think of the bean that does have a life cycle in terms of its role. It gets instantiated, it produces, and then it goes out of scope, or it, it, it eventually gets garbage collected. Um, we have server providers, container providers, developers, deployers. Out. We have different types of roles that are being played in terms of the components. And uh, the life cycle of the enterprise we goes through various different stages. Um, and each type of the being a session has different life cycles associated with them. And uh, the life cycle itself is going to be anything from, and think of this sort of like process life cycles. You know, at any one moment of time, a process on, the, on a system it could be running, it could be waiting, it could be sleeping, it could be blocked. Um, which is sort of you know something to keep in mind in terms of the bean technology. It has an object life cycle as well, and so the ob object life cycle, if it doesn't exist, it gets created. The instantiation gets created, and then it's ready. Then it's being used. Then it's pulled. So it goes from doesn't exist <coughs> to being pulled or used to back to ready, removed, ready, and then eventually it'll be garbage collected when it's no longer being used um, when the server's over. It, so. And that was the rest of the Java Bean information for you. Kind of a hodgepodge of different uh, different technologies, and uh, it's not anything outside of what you've already know in terms of Java programming. You know, it's all written in Java. It's all the same thing. It's just different components of different types of applications. I shouldn't call them applications. Different pieces of applications, like. You know, and you don't need any of this stuff. I mean, you don't need to use a bean ever, but it comes in handy. You don't need to use a container, but it comes in handy. So these are basically tools in a toolbox that you could put together to create some customized application um, interfaces, and protection, security, and development. So Anyway, so that concludes uh, the enterprise bean information. And so next time we'll have a different topic. Actually, next time we're going to talk about Corba, actually. So let me end this video.